I'm the founder of ByteBase, which is uh, the bite-sized knowledge base for engineers. Um, and we help engineering teams share knowledge better. And so while I was building out ByteBase, I had to build in uh, live collaboration. And so that's how I got started with Django real-time chat. And, and we chose Django channels. So yeah, so this is actually a talk uh, adapted from uh, a tutorial I did at DjangoCon in San Diego just a few weeks ago. Uh, so I'll show you guys some code if you want to go further afterwards. Um, cool. Alright, so I just kind of did this. I'm Kara. Hi. Uh, yeah, I live in, in San Francisco and I'm working on ByteBase. And so our goals for today are going to be to go over, I know some people maybe have worked with WebSockets, but what are WebSockets? Why do we want to use them? Um, then Django Channels, which is our way of implementing WebSockets. And then uh, a little bit on deploying channels, although that part was more for the tutorial. Cool. So I think probably most people here have built a Django application using HTTP. Yes? OK. If not, that's cool. No, no worries if you have it. Um, but so, so like the, the default web application that we build is HTTP. So what you have is the client is going to send a request HTTP request, and it gets back a response. <coughs> and so it's super simple, it's stateless, and it's supported by all browsers. <coughs> Wonderful. Also supported by Django, by default. Uh, but the problem is that it doesn't have real-time support. Uh, so for example, with ByteBase, we need for teammates to be able to collaborate within one workspace at the same time. And so HTTP requests just didn't cut it. And I think you guys will probably see that's the case for a lot of your applications. Cool. So there are a couple of options uh, that I explored. And I'm, ex I'm interested to hear what, what else you guys have heard about uh, when we just uh, landed on Django channels. Uh, but I just wanted to touch on them quickly so you, you can see my process. So the first is polling. Uh, so polling is just over HTTP. And what you do is you send an HTTP request and get a response. <coughs> Wait some amount of time, that's not that long. Send another request, get a response. And so polling or um, long polling, um, it's also stateless, just like HTTP. It's also supported by all browsers, which is great. Uh, but it, the main thing is it's not actually real time. And also you may end up seeing that uh, your application is getting that uh, that warning message from like Safari or Google Chrome saying like this is using too much energy and that's kind of embarrassing if you built that app. <laughs> so we didn't go with that one. Uh, so another uh, protocol that we considered is server sent events. And so instead of the request response, you actually have the server pushing uh, data to clients asynchronously. And so it looks something like this, push. And then when you have something new, push again. Um, and so this is real time, unlike the polling approach. Um, but it's limited to only one direction. You don't have uh, push back in the other way from the client. And there are a couple of other limitations, too, around the types of data that you can send. And it doesn't have universal browser support. So. Yeah, so polling and server sent events were pretty interesting, uh, but now we're up to WebSockets, which is what we actually chose. Uh, and so WebSockets, it's a protocol that supports two-way communication between clients and servers. And so unlike HTTP, uh, you don't have the request, response, wait some time, request, response. You actually just have this persistent connection, which you can use for real-time communication in your application. So. Um, Cool, so it supports binary data, so there are no limitations there. Pretty much all browsers are supporting it, from my experience. And then the main downside is that the network infrastructure configuration you have to do, which maybe you enjoy as DevOps, uh, <laughs> is a little bit tricky. And so that's something I, that took me a little bit longer than I wish it had, so I'm happy to share it with you. And so let's cover how it works. So at the beginning, you have the same request response. So uh, the client is going to send an HTTP request with an upgrade header. And then it's going to get a response that we're switching protocols to WebSocket protocol. And then now you have this persistent connection, which 
you can use forever, unless if something goes wrong, but we'll cover that later. Uh, cool, so this is uh, what a WebSocket upgrade header looks like. Um, cool, so upgrade WebSocket connection upgrade. And yeah, and so, so one more point I, I want to make is that uh, the WebSocket protocol is distinct from the HTTP protocol, but it's completely compatible uh, because it uses this upgrade header. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're both protocols that operate at the application layer, if you're familiar with this, but they are compatible, which is pretty convenient. Any questions so far while I'm zooming through this? No? Okay. So who uses WebSockets? This was fun to investigate. So the first one that was pretty obvious to me was Slack uses WebSockets. Uh, and, and yeah, in your browser you can just in check out the network. <coughs> so upgrade WebSocket. Another one is Facebook uses WebSockets to up update your Facebook feed. And ESPN also uses it to update the scores. Cool. And now, now we're going to learn how to use it. Okay. So Django channels. So this is Django's way of providing support for WebSockets. So the, the main thing that Django channels provides is the ability to use the same Django that probably everyone is pretty familiar with and hopefully loves, uh, but in an asynchronous way so that it can uh, support the type of communication that isn't request response, but actually this persistent connection. So something that's really cool about Django channels is we're going over it in the context of WebSockets and the WebSocket protocol, but actually it will apply to uh, pretty much, hopefully, <laughs> their intent is that it should apply to a wide range of protocols in the future. So once you learn Django channels, now you've extended Django uh, to all sorts of protocols. And yeah, I just covered this, so it's adding an asynchronous layer for supporting long-running connections. And so just to make sure that we understand what that means. Uh, so typically code is synchronous, which means that it's blocking while it's processing. That includes waiting for I.O. It's going to be blocking. Uh, and that means that it, it's pretty inefficient. The benefit you get is that it's really simple, it's easier to debug, it's safe. And so how I, I, I forget exactly where I had seen this, but a different Python tutorial that if you imagine someone is a chess player, uh, then she would play one game, wait for the opponent to go back and forth, finish the game, and then play the next game and do again back and forth. And so this is synchronous chess playing or synchronous coding. And so when we instead turn to asynchronous, the biggest difference is that when you're pausing, especially for I.O., you can go and do something else. And so you end up with something that's much more efficient. And of course, the challenge is that you're likely to get some more unfortunate bugs because it's no longer as simple. It's not safe. Why is it not safe? It's not safe because you have two things going at the same time, so you need to be smart and make sure that you don't do conflicting uh, actions. So it requires more management. Yes, okay. it's not it's not safe by <laughs> default, I guess. Thanks for the question. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So so again, in the in the chess approach, you would have this chess player who's doing one move on the first board, and then while she waits for her opponent, doing the next move on the other board, and so it's much faster. Cool. And so. So now let's get into Django channels. So just to, to reiterate, Django channels has this asynchronous ability to Django. And the core component of Django channels is consumers. So consumers are kind of like views uh, in Django. They look very similar to views. And instead of uh, waiting for HTTP requests, they're going to consume events. And so, let's see what one looks like. So this is our first consumer. It's taken from like, Django's uh, Django channel tutorial website. And we can see there's this connect section, which is just accepting all connections. 
uh, the disconnect one, which we didn't go over, and then this receive piece, which is a little bit different. And yeah, here we're receiving messages from the client and then uh, sending the message back to the same client. This piece of, at least for me, when I was looking through the tutorial, I missed this. <laughs> so something that's different is here you're receiving, uh, but then you actually need to send the message to your own client in order to see it show up on your screen. And so this code would work if I were just in one browser window by myself and wanted to see messages that I'm writing show up as I go. But obviously that's not the point of using Django channels. The point is collaborating live with someone else. So in order to do that, we're going to need the channels layer. And the channels layer is basically just a Redis layer that enables clients to talk to each other. Um, so a channel, it's a mailbox where messages can be sent to, corresponds to someone who is in the browser. And then a group, also intuitive, it's a group of channels. So if you want to send messages to a group of clients at the same time, you can use the, use the group interface to do that. Cool. So here we're getting a slightly more advanced consumer. Uh, so I'm just zooming in on this. So. Okay, so one thing to point out is here, so we have our room name, we have our group name, and then with Django channels, because we are adding an asynchronous layer to Django's synchronous layer, we need to actually be explicit uh, when we're converting between the two. So that's where you get this async to sync syntax. But the key thing here is that, unlike before when we were connecting and just accepting all connections, here we're actually joining a room and joining the group. And likewise, now you'll see when we receive a message from a WebSocket, we actually are sending it to the group, right? Not just to ourselves, although we still do need to send it to ourselves below. Any, any questions on these code snippets? No? Okay, they'll all be available on GitHub after. Do you have a question? No, I was just okay. trying to okay. keep looking. Okay, cool. Good. Great. Okay, so yeah, so just to... To reiterate, the consumer is going to have a connect, a disconnect, a receive, and then sending message to yourself. Great. And, and yeah, you'll see here, just to highlight again, that receiving message from a group, you actually have to have these names correspond to one another. Okay, and so rest. So, anyone used Redis before? Yeah. Okay, everyone, pretty much. Or not everyone, but a bunch of people. Cool, so Redis is just a cache. Uh, and in the case of Django channels, it lets you route messages between clients. And the cool thing about using Redis with Django channels, this isn't the, um, the only option for your backing store, but it works pretty much out of the box. But for me setting it up, there was very little work to do. You just have this channels Redis library. This is the beginning of it. All right, and then you just configure your channels layer in your settings.py file. Does it also work with memcache? Yeah, okay. I think it would be a little, I had explored that also. You have to do a little more work yourself, whereas Redis, like the, this is basically it. And okay. one more line that I'll show you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, let's see. So deploying. So cool. So most Django applications use a Wishy server, so something like Unicorn, and yeah, synchronous standard for Python web apps. But like I said a couple of times, Django channels is different because it's asynchronous, and so we're going to need asynchronous server gateway interface. And so the standard that we use here is Daphne. So everything Unicorn. Instead, you're going to take Daphne. And so something cool about Daphne is that it can handle both HTTP and WebSockets. So it can handle synchronous, but it also can handle asynchronous. So uh, when I was looking, like doing some research for how we want to implement it, I saw that 
and some engineers had just replaced Gunicorn with Daphne entirely. Uh, but then a lot of engineers were warning against doing that because even though Daphne is pretty proven, it's not as proven as Gunicorn. So the standard that you see is HTTP requests go to a Gunicorn server, and then WebSocket requests go to a Daphne server. But if you'd like to, and especially for a prototype, you can just use Daphne. And yeah, you just configure this line in settings.py. Cool. And uh, so in our setup, and a common way to do it is to use Nginx as a proxy server. Anyone use Nginx before? Okay. Uh, so in this case, we'd have Nginx going to Daphne for the WebSocket traffic, and then to Gunicorn for the HTTP traffic. Uh, and so we had talked before about how the WebSocket protocol works over HTTP. So you first send an HTTP upgrade request, then you get back a response, sure, we're switching protocols, 101, uh, and then now you have this persistent connection. So Nginx is where we handle this upgrade request. And let me show you what it looks like. So you just add these two lines in uh, this area. So you can see in this Nginx config, we have the WebSocket traffic going to an Azure Daphne server, and then we have all other traffic going to Wiji. And then for the Azure, we have this upgrade header and connection upgrade. Cool, and then um, one last thing I wanted to touch on is um, so far we've talked about kind of like the fundamentals of getting it up and running, but then uh, for us, like we've actually had this in production now for a couple of months, and so there are some things that you encounter. So one of them is that, uh, like I said, you have this upgrade request, switching protocols, and now you have this persistent WebSocket connection, but like everything in engineering, uh, that WebSocket connection can die. Uh, so the first thing that you do as a defense against it is there are various uh, open source <laughs> libraries that do reconnecting for you. Uh, so that's step one. So reconnecting WebSocket, not just the standard WebSocket. And then the second thing uh, that uh, pretty much uh, all companies that use WebSockets do is implement a ping pong. Uh, so basically, there are a couple of states that your WebSocket could be in. If it's closed, and you have a reconnecting WebSocket, then it's going to automatically reopen. But if it's in a closing state or opening state and gets stuck there, then your reconnecting WebSocket, as I learned <laughs> a few months ago, is going to fail you. And it's not going to reconnect. So instead, what you can do is periodically, I think the standard is around 10 seconds, you do a ping pong and make sure that the connection is still open. And if it's not, then you reconnect. And that's all I have for you guys. So um, yeah, I'll be around after if you want to chat or you can email me or tweet. And then this is uh, the GitHub repository. I've gone through this and also some AWS stuff. So yeah, you can feel free to check that out there and ask me any questions. Any questions?